On the 13th of August, 1329, Christine Carpenter was granted permission to become an anchoress. The anchoretic vocation was one of extreme seclusion. In one cell, they lived, ate, slept, worked, and prayed in solitude until the end of their lives. They had little to no physical contact with anybody and were rarely seen or heard. A typical anchor hold was attached to the wall of the parish church with one small window facing outwards and a smaller opening or squint facing into the church through which she could confess her sins and receive the Eucharist. Unlike hermits, anchorites could never go outside. Now, if any of this is starting to sound horribly familiar, you're not alone. Previously a somewhat neglected corner of mostly women's history, anchoritism has been experiencing a really unprecedented level of relevance in the public imagination since the coronavirus lockdown. Parish blog posts, magazine articles, several think pieces, and even a segment on Radio 4 have seen commentators turn to the medieval period's original lockdown queens, hoping for inspiration. Clearly, anchorites were never supposed to be performers, and it's not often that they're relevant to musicology conferences. They lived contemplative, secluded lives, and were actively discouraged from contact with the public. So in the context of Christine Carpenter, the level of attention which they're receiving in the year of our Lord 2020 is somewhat apt. Three years after becoming an anchorite, Christine Carpenter caused something of an ecclesiastical scandal. From four surviving letters by Bishop John de Stratford of Winchester, we know that she left her cell and made it all the way from Surrey to Avignon. There, she seems to have confessed to the papal court and asked to be allowed to return to her cell, which she was, possibly, after some form of corporal punishment. Her story has been adapted into a novel by Paul Moorcraft, a film by Chris Newby called Anchoress, and a play by Arnold Wesker. In 1991, Robert Saxton adapted Wesker's play into the chamber opera Caritas, which is the subject of my paper today. Priori vitae, rebus mundanis omnis no mortuae. Opus estai. Music is significant in its absence from Newby's film Anchoress. Even during Christine's immurement ceremony, where Wesker's play and Saxon's opera both feature diegetic chants lifted from pontificals which are contemporary to Christine's life, there is no chant. Newby's soundscape for Christine instead makes incredibly immersive use of ambient noises and other senses to situate her at the centre of the parish community. The only time music is heard in Newby's film is at the very end, when Christine makes a somewhat fantastical escape via an underground cave system to the sound of this traditional Bulgarian love song. As she caresses the walls, it seems an expression of women's sexuality stretching back through history and calls to mind some of the more exoticizing tendencies in medievalism which are beyond the scope of this paper. The end of Saxon's Caritas also zooms in on Christine's touch, but this is conversely the only spoken part of an otherwise entirely through-composed and sung opera. Opening with Christine's immurement ceremony, Act 1 of Caritas spans 12 scenes, with the audience watching from outside Christine's cell as her family grow more and more concerned about the mental strain of her solitude. Departing from the historic record, Wesker and Saxton's Christine never leaves her cell, and while she and her family beg the bishop to let her go, he refuses. During the entourage to Ritchikar, her cell rotates. Act 2 then allows the audience to watch from inside Christine's cell and partakes of the long operatic tradition of the mad scene as she realises that she's trapped there forever. Its culmination is a fade to black as she paces her cell, touching its sides and muttering, this is a wall, and this is a wall, and this is a wall.
In both of these reimaginings of Christian's life, the presence or absence of song directly correlates with the extent to which she is free. The extent to which she is vibrant, sensuous, or loving within that framework, however, is far more ambivalent. By virtue of their solitude, the Anchorites were not an order, but lay people, and overwhelmingly women. The distinction between cloistered and solitary vocations is borne out neatly in their initiation rites. When nuns take holy orders, they are marrying Christ, whereas the office for the enclosure of Anchorites has much more in common with funeral liturgy. In some, the Anchorite would lie in her own grave and be anointed with oil, in effect becoming dead to the world. The Anchorite from then on was conceived as a liminal space between the mortal world and the life everlasting. Also unlike nuns, Anchorites did not adhere to an established rule, but instead had access to a variety of literature, especially guidance books and devotional poetry. Of this literature, the most widely circulated at the time and well known today is Anchorin Wiss, or Guide for Anchoresses, although at least 12 other examples survive. Anchorin Wiss is associated with two groups of texts in the AB dialect of Middle English, the mostly hagiographical Catherine group and the wooing group, which contains lyrical meditations on the Sponsor Christi or Spouse of Christ motif. The latter's titular text, The Wooing of Our Lord, combines courtly love imagery of Christ as the ultimate lover knight with intensely erotic descriptions of the Passion. This literature refers to Jesus as my honey drop, references his blissful bloody body, and expresses a desire to be nailed on the cross with him in a loving embrace. Sentiments such as these embody a conflation of suffering and eroticism which pervades anchoritic mysticism. In the case of Saxon's Caritas, these complex intersubjective flows of desire, embodiment and transcendence in spectatorship deeply resonate with the study of opera. The longest study on Caritas to date is by medievalist Wyndham Thomas in his 2012 monograph. What I want to contend with today about his reading is this suggestion that Caritas is dominated by a theme of opposites between inside and outside, sacred and secular, soul and body, powerful and powerless, and so on. Contra Thomas, I propose that the most important thing we can learn from anchoritic thought is that dualistic symbolism can always be angled towards something more, not least because, for medieval Christendom, all differences paled in comparison to the difference between God and man. As Caroline Walker Bynum puts it, in the blinding light of the ultimate dichotomy between God and humanity, all other dichotomies faded, and that dichotomy is yet still embodied by Christ and rendered tangible in the Eucharist. Aside from its historic significance, Wiss's attraction to Wesker probably rested upon its dramatic potential. It is, after all, for its vivid imagery that Anchorin Wiss and the wooing of our Lord convey both the erotic and the funereal. The Wiss, for example, contains an injunction for the anchoress who takes pleasure in the beauty of her own hands to scrape up the earth every day out of the pit in which she must rot. The enclosed condition of Wiss's readership inspires its method of conveying the fold between life and death, firstly on a symbolic level. The anchorhold is a tomb to share with Christ, through whom all things can be revealed, and from whence to be resurrected. But Wiss goes further, implicating the anchorite's body itself. The anchorhold is also the wound in Christ's side, into which the anchorite should climb, and from which poured the blood which birthed the church. Yet as Christ bleeds and births the anchoress, so must she weep like his mother and like his lover. I'll expand on some of this heady imagery later, but what's at once apparent is anchoritic literature's emphasis on the absolute permeability of the anchorite's supposedly untouchable body and dwelling place, and her remarkable vitality for one supposedly dead to the world. It is possible to read Caritas for a simple lens of inside versus outside, like Thomas does, but what I hope this video will demonstrate is that splitting anything so hermeneutically complex as an opera or an anchoritic vocation into convenient binarisms ultimately inhibits any effort to look beyond the page, take stock of what a performance might convey, or gesture towards that which cannot be pinned down. In Caritas, Christine's perception of the anchoritic life is at its most explicit when she is forced to defend it. At the start of scene three, her ex-fiancé Robert visits her window to confront her for leaving him. I'm now going to give you a little snapshot analysis of the harmonic workings in this argument scene, and then briefly venture to say what we can learn from this kind of medievalist thinking that my project engages in. It's 
These opening pedals in scene 3 establish a central tritone axis between F and B in the bass. The harmony changes each time a different person sings, shifting our perception between their perspectives. The wind and upper strings don't quite shift simultaneously, so our perception is always blurred and slightly ambiguous. Several characters in Caritas use distinctive intervallic patterns in their vocal lines, which Thomas has done a really good overview of. Christine often sings strings of major thirds when she's being particularly optimistic and pious, while Robert is more inclined towards cycles of fifths. This is going to become quite important. Both these characters make use of prominent tritones, and a particularly extreme example of this is when Robert sings But a Devil of Your Own to a chain of tritones and minor sixths. The slightly hackneyed symbolic link between the devil and the tritone may well apply in this very explicit case but should be wielded with caution um, and should never be applied too broadly in post-tonal music where tritones are sort of fairly ubiquitous anyway. More significantly, Robert's tritone sixth pattern represents interlocking iterations of this three note set. This is a transposed inversion of the pitches to which he sang the first words of the scene, it's not God you serve, and it spans a tritone via a whole tone and a major third. This three note set reappears throughout this section of scene three, across the ensemble and in various guises. Robert's declamatory statements set these intervals up as significant and congruent with the accompaniment's B flat F tritone pedal. Because each of this set's intervals contain an even number of semitones, they are also whole tonal. Therefore, they can only carry common pitches between transpositions of an even number of semitones and are divided into two mutually exclusive groups, one for each whole tone scale. The symmetry between them conjures a two-sided harmonic landscape. Whenever somebody sings a semitone, they cross this breach as if reaching through the window of the anchor hold. That is precisely what Robert does when he sings, He made you for the world, the world for you. The first part of the phrase repeats a sensuous semitonal triplet figure, and it's as if he's implying an attempted seduction of Christine. Her rebuttal, in Here's the World, Out There is Clutter, is marked by Saxton to be sung simply and with determination. When you plot her pitches here, and her harmonisation, onto this tone nets, it's as if she's constructed a three-dimensional harmonic anger hold with which to surround herself. The two-sided whole tonal landscape is further disrupted by Robert's characteristic fifth. When he sings, that's man, cruel man are driving to a stridently rising cycle of dominant fifths, and then descends again with black is white and white is black, he is interloping with a series of intervals that derive the very dynamism of their cycle from semitonal asymmetry. When Christine finally bursts out, Love, Robert, love, I can't say more, at the end of this interaction. The harmonic texture abruptly breaks off with two tutti staccatissimo chords. As she sings the second love to an F sharp following a B, she finally crosses away from her whole tone side and into Robert's, and she gets there via the relationship of the fifth sung to his name.
If Robert's campaign of cycles of fifths is what galvanises Christian into such an outburst, it is significant that his longest series of fifths sets the opera's first allusion to anchoring Wiss. When he sings, black is white and white is black, your words are wind and mist, Robert captures a crucial aspect of anchoritic spirituality, its productive relationship between black and white vividness and misty ambiguity. The contrast between black and white appears twice in anchoring Wiss. Firstly, the author instruction on Cress on how to address an ignorant person who asks whether her order wears a black or a white habit. I am black and yet white, she saith, dark outwardly and bright within. In this manner answer you any one who asks you concerning your order, and, whether white or black, say that you are both through the grace of God. The second mention concerns how an anchoress should adorn her windows. Let the cloth upon them be twofold, black cloth, the cross white, within and without. The black cloth signifies that you are black and of no estimation with the world without. The cross is appropriate to white and unstained, made in purity. To be not bifurcated but twofold, both and rather than either or, through the grace of God, is a subjectivity expressed again and again in Anchorin Wiss. It is the paradoxical rule of life for one dead to the world. What is crucial about the windows and the body of the anchoress being the locus of this black and whiteness is that these are the points at which the walls are breached. They are the apertures through which sound and light leak, prying eyes peep in and ears eavesdrop, while the curious anchorite gazes out and listens. As Anchorin Wish states, You see that your parlour windows be always fast on every side, and likewise well shut, and mind your eyes there, lest your heart escape. The anchoress is the gatekeeper of these apertures. As Jocelyn Price puts it, her existence seems the visible instituting of a boundary line between flesh and spirit. It is through these boundaries that the fleshy God Christ enters, the frontier between pain and pleasure in the wound group at which honey is licked off the crown of thorns. The anchoress enters Christ's wound even as he enters her heart. In turn, she is surrounded by a community of onlookers for whom she is both the eccentric scandal and the praying anchor. Through these paradoxical interlocking enclosures, Price writes, the anchoress herself becomes a location, a site of communal identity construction, and a private space where Jesus may enter and dwell. When we spectate upon the anchorite's erotics of divine and earthly love, we are unavoidably part of that dynamic. We listen as Christine paces her walls and hears someone imprisoned who still has the strength to caress. At each invocation of a love at once divine and erotic, she transcends her cell, reaching out and beyond. We must make ourselves vulnerable if we want to reach in, listen and understand. <laughs> 